Well, th thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to talk to people about history because it's my favorite subject. I've done it as long as I can remember and have always enjoyed it. And the great thing about history is you never get bored by it because there's always another period, always another thing to read, always something else to find out about. I think it's very important to study history, not just for people who want to spend their lives doing it, as I've been very lucky to do, but very important to study history because of what it helps us understand about our world, about ourselves, and about others. It also, I think, is very important to, to study history because so much is said in the name of history, and I think it's very important to be able to question that. And we hear so often uh, political leaders, for example, saying history teaches us that we must follow such and such a policy, which is exactly when I think we need to become very skeptical indeed. And I think what history should teach us is a questioning mind should give us some evidence with which to test assertions being made by others and, and by ourselves and give us a sense of the world in which we live because I feel very strongly, and I'd like to talk about that first, that we really cannot understand the world, ourselves and others unless we understand the past. And I think if you think of your own personal experiences, I think you will, you will know instinctively how important it is to understand what's happened to the people you're dealing with. How, how can you understand others unless you know something of their history? It's not that we're shaped entirely by our histories, but what has happened to us in our lives, where we come from, the communities we, we are born into, the communities we choose to live in, it's all part of what makes us who we are. And it's what makes others who they are. And I think that operates at an individual and a personal level, but of course it also operates at the level of groups and the level of nations. And I think really to understand the world in which we live and to, and to get a sense of our environments, it is very important to understand the past. Without knowing the past, I think we deprive ourselves of a tremendous source of information and understanding. And you can all think of examples of just how important the past is. And impossible, I think, to understand the conflict between Jews and Arabs in, in the state of Israel and, and, and in Palestine. Impossible to understand that conflict without remembering the history of each and without knowing what they each remember. Because, of course, each people, and it's true of many such conflicts and, or disputes around the world, have different versions of the past. And I think one key to trying to understand why they take the attitudes they do uh, is to understand that past. I think it's also very important to be wary of the ways in which history can be used. I mean, history is a very powerful tool, and I think we're getting a, a sense of just how powerful it can be. It's a very important part of the formation of identities. People define themselves often through cultural values, through religious values, through uh, shared, lingu shared, shared languages, but they also define themselves very much through a shared past. And I think, again, we need to understand that and we need to understand where those interpretations, those versions of the past, those narratives of the past can also be a trap because historians are not always impartial. They do not always try and write a history which, which brings into the account different perspectives. What, what historians often do will write histories which give a particular view of the past of a group, of the past of a nation. And if we look at the 19th century, which is really when so much of the nationalism which has caused such tremendous repercussions and, and often such tremendous trouble in the modern world where, where that nationalism was born. You can see the role of history in creating nationalisms, creating national stories, creating a sense that, for example, there was always something called a German people or always something called a French people or always something called an English people. And in fact, when you look at history, you see that that is not true at all, that people didn't identify themselves for much of the past in terms of nationality. Indeed, even in the 20th century, you had peoples who didn't and, and still don't identify themselves primarily in terms of whatever nation they belong to. But what you got in the 19th century was, was the creation of this sense that there was something called the nation which had existed for a long time. What's always very convenient is that wonderful phrase, the mists of antiquity. You can put anything back into the mists of antiquity because you can't prove it. And you can argue that nations have been around for centuries and centuries because really it's almost impossible to prove. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a great attempt to prove it. And you got, we can, I mean, I can find plenty of examples, absolutely absurd nationalist histories, which portrayed a very one-sided view as if this nation had always inevitably existed and, and was therefore destined to have its own territory, its, its own autonomy. And you got similarly, while national histories were being created, you, you got the stereotyping of others. I mean, I've just,
in, in the course of doing my book on the First World War, I became very interested in what people were learning at school because often what nations decide should be taught in the schools says something about how they see themselves. I mean, you have at the moment in the UK a tremendous debate about what should little British school children be learning about their own past. Should it be a triumphalist version of the past? Should they concentrate on the heroes and not on the dark side? I mean, the, these are debates that go on in every country. But you got, in the, in the 19th century, I became very interested in this, and I found wonderful things um, in, in both, the, well, let's just take one example, French and German schools. And this was not just at the high school level or the primary school level, this was respected professors in universities such as this one, writing these really extraordinarily one-sided and, and unbelievable national histories. I mean, one, one example I loved was of the German, very learned German historian who argued that German civilization, Teuton civilization, he called it, had always been superior to French civilization. Now this tied in with particular national rivalries at the time and of course a, a worry that the Germans had that the French wanted revenge for France's loss in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. What was difficult for this particular German historian was that in fact everyone admitted that there were times when French civilization had produced wonderful things, wonderful cathedrals, wonderful culture, during the reign of Louis XIV, France had really been the model for Europe. So how did he explain it away? He said those in France who did the great things were really Teutons. <laughs> and he spent his holidays going around France, looking at effigies on tombs and looking at paintings, identifying what he said, he would look at the statue of a famous French statesman and say, that man has a Teuton nose. He clearly is genetically Teutonic. Now we can laugh at this, but th th these are very powerful formulations, and we've seen it operating much more recently in our own times. I mean, you think of the breakup of Yugoslavia, when you suddenly got these competing historical narratives, the Serbs, or not all Serbs, but Serb nationalists arguing that Serbians had always been on the front lines fighting against Islam, which is a complete distortion of history, but, but a very powerful one. And this was used to justify all sorts of atrocities against Croatians and against Bosnian Muslims. The Croatians had a similar nationalist narrative, where Croatians were the ones who'd always been right and Serbs were the ones who'd always been wrong. And so these uses of history, I think, can be very, very dangerous, which it seems to me all the more reason why we should know something about history, that we should be able to identify when history is being written in a tendentious and in a particular way. Now, history isn't always, I think, used for bad purposes. I mean, it, it has been too often, but I think it's often used for, for, for understanding it can be used to further understanding and to help to overcome conflicts. I mean, one of the very promising things that began to happen with Irish history was when you got historians both in the north of Ireland and in the south beginning to look again at Irish history and beginning to examine some of the myths which had bedeviled that history. And so you got historians, Irish historians, questioning the myth that Protestants and Catholics had always been opposed to each other. And you got Protestant Irish historians questioning the myth that Catholic, Catholic Irish had never really cared about the great struggle, for example, against fascism and Nazism in the Second World War. And, and, and you know, so th this, I think, was very, very important in beginning a process of reconciliation between both sides. It's not easy. In Israel, there was an attempt to write a textbook, an attempt by professors at a, a Jewish uh, university in Israel and, a, and a, a West Bank University, an Arab West Bank University, to write a shared textbook. They weren't even trying to write a common history. What they were trying to do was write a textbook which gave children the sense that there were two parallel histories here and allowed them to compare those histories and see where they differed. And the textbook, which was written, I think has been very, very difficult to get adopted in schools in Israel and on the West Bank because, this, the, the, well, the sensitivities are still so acute and, and the conflict still goes on. But it seems to me that history can be used to overcome differences, to try and explode some of the very hurtful and damaging myths of the past. I think what history can also do, and, and this again is why I find it fascinating, is I think it can help us to think about current problems. There, there are many ways of thinking about issues. I mean, we're living at a very complicated time in the world today. I think it's, it's a time of rapid social change. I mean, we, we think of the electronic revolution, which has really in most of our lifetimes simply transformed the way in which communications work and, and will go on transforming them. We think of the shift in the international situation. I mean, you have in the United States, a power which has been hegemonic, which is now, I think, less 
dominant than it once was. It's still a very powerful country, but it's less dominant and it seems at the moment to be completely transfixed by its own internal problems and, and really incapable of thinking about much else. And we have rising powers such as China and India and Brazil. So we, we're living through an interesting time in the world with great challenges. Um, of course, I haven't even mentioned climate change, which is a global challenge or the tremendous challenge of, of um, a, a, a globalized economy and what that can mean both for good and, and for bad. And I think history is one of the ways in which we can help think about it. I mean, there are other ways, I think political science, philosophy, theology, all these things are important as we think about such issues. But I think history can help if only because it can provide the basis on which to ask questions. I mean, where history can be very helpful is in analogies. And so we look at a situation, and we do this again in, in our own personal lives as much as we do in, in dealing with greater issues or great issues. Um, we ask, is there a similar situation? Is there something that can help us ask questions? Is there something that can help us identify factors that might or might not make a difference? And I think history can be helpful in this. I mean, when the coalition forces went into Iraq in, at the beginning of, of the 1990s, uh, sorry, the beginning of the, of the 2000s, perhaps they should have looked at what happened to other powers which tried to control that very complicated part of the world. They should have looked at what happened to the British when they had a mandate in Iraq after the First World War, and when they had to deal with a very strong Iraqi nationalism, when they had to deal with a society in which there were many different factions, and the British did not have an easy time of it. And if the coalition had paid a little bit more attention to what had happened in that previous period, they might have been able to ask the right questions. Instead of assuming that all Iraqis would welcome them with open arms and immediately become um, Democrats building a civil society, they might have asked, what was it that Iraqis wanted? What was it that Iraqis might worry about? Um, what had been the experience of Iraqis with outsiders before, before they assumed that certain things would happen? I mean, it was very telling, I think, when the coalition forces went into Iraq, that in both the United States and Britain, the governments took very little interest in the history. When the soldiers got there, one of the first things they began to do, apparently, was send back to places like back Blackwells and ask for copies of The Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence, because they felt it gave them at least some handle on what was going on. I mean, interestingly enough, the military often understand the importance of history because they are dealing with people on the ground for whom history matters a lot, and they're having to deal with people who have been shaped by very different societies. And so I think what history can do is help us to ask questions, what if we do this? What should we look out for? I mean, in the present situation, what is the danger, or what are the potential dangers in dealing with shifts in international power? And I think this is something we, we do have to be careful of because shifts in international power are not always easy. Declining powers don't like being declining powers. Now think of the British Empire or, or think now of, of the United States, which is relatively declining even if it's not absolutely declining. And so how do they manage it and how should the rising powers manage it? How should they try and overcome the sensitivities and fears that declining powers might have? And it doesn't always turn out badly. I mean, I think it turned out badly between Britain and Germany in 1914, when the British felt very pressured by Germany, which was becoming economically very powerful, competing with Britain around the world. And that ended, of course, in, in conflict. But Britain and the United States faced a similar situation. Britain and the United States nearly came to war at the end of the 19, 1890s, and they didn't. Both sides pulled back, both sides managed what was a complicated transition in history. So I think history can help by helping us formulate questions. I don't believe it can offer quick, clear lessons. When people say it's quite clear, history shows us this, don't believe them. Um, history can show you anything you like because there's just so much of it. And so what you need to do is keep an open mind and be prepared to formulate questions. I mean, part, a great key to trying to understand what we do is, is asking the right questions, simply asking the right questions about things. So I do history because it seems to me that it helps me to understand the world, it helps me to understand issues, it helps me perhaps to certainly not predict the future but make an educated guess about what is likely to happen. But on the whole, I do history because I absolutely love it. I find it fascinating, there's always a new story, there's always something going on. I mean, most historians probably wouldn't admit this, but we are great gossips. We love the nitty gritty, we love the gossip of history, we love reading about all these extraordinary people, we love the details of the past. I mean, when I was a child, there was a wonderful series of books called Everyday Life in, it's Everyday Life in Egypt, Everyday Life in Ancient Rome, I mean, some of you may have read them. And it told you what children your age were reading, playing with, 
and what games they played, what sort of things they learned at school, what sort of household chores they had to do, what they wore, what, the, what sort of sandals they wore on their feet. It's absolutely fascinating. And so I think in the end you do history because it's great fun and because, at least for me, it's endlessly entertaining. And if you want to think of history being good for you, it probably is good because it gives us a bit of a sense of humility. Um, the past is filled with very clever people with all sorts of power and all sorts of ac access to information who got it absolutely wrong. And humility is not a bad thing as we approach a complicated world as, as we try to get on with our lives. We don't always know best and I think the past can remind us of that as well. So I'll stop now because I've gone on I think probably too long, but I'm happy to answer any questions or, or hear any comments that you might have. No, but I, I, I'm not sure history is ever completely objective. I mean, you, when you write history, you try and write as comprehensive and as fair a history as you can, but our perspectives are always shifting so that we ask different questions. You know, we ask questions often that are, that are our own preoccupations at the time. I mean, when I was a student, there was virtually no women's history because no one thought women had a history worth worrying about. And then when you had a women's movement, suddenly women's history became important. So I think environmental history is now important because I think we're now much more worried about the environment. So I think history will go on changing because it will reflect the preoccupations of each generation. What really concerns me in a funny way about history now is, is the two things, I think. The quantity of information. Um, you know, I did, a, I did a book on Nixon's trip to China, which was terrifying in a way because Nixon, transcri Ni Nixon taped all his telephone conversations and he loved talking on the phone. So if I'd really wanted to, I could have spent four years listening to Nixon's telephone conversations because you know, it was in real time, that's what it would have taken. Um, so there's almost too much information and, and emails. But the other problem now, of course, is that people are becoming, well, perhaps two problems. One is how do you store emails? Um, and even, I mean, some of you are too young to remember, but I mean, I still have somewhere a box of three and a, is it three and a quarter inch floppy disks? Mm -hmm. Which, there are no three and a quarter inch floppy disk readers around because the technology has changed so quickly. There may be a couple somewhere. So a lot of what I had stored on those disks is probably irretrievable. Um, the second thing I think that is really a worry is that everyone is now, thanks to WikiLeaks and, and then the most recent, the Snowden thing, we're much more aware of, of how easily electronic inform uh, information in electronic form is, is transmitted. And what I've heard from people in government, both here and in Canada and, and in the US, is they're just not putting stuff on paper and they're not sending emails around because it can come back to haunt them. And so, for example, I talked to someone in Washington who'd been involved in you know, the, the sort of intense negotiations in, in, was it 2008, when the world economic system nearly melted down. And he said, we have, no, we have no minutes of those meetings. All we have is the record of what we decided. But he said, all the real discussions were in the corridors outside because we didn't want anything recorded. And I think diplomats are now going to be much more cautious about what they send back to their own governments. You know, because if you think, you know, you say that so-and-so is a ghastly little dictator whose wife is beating him or whatever, you know, you, you, if you look at the stuff that people were saying in the WikiLeaks stuff, they've been quite open about it. I don't think this is going to happen anymore because they're not going to send back frank things to their own governments about the places they're accredited because it could get out and damage their governments. So I, I think future historians are going to have a really difficult time. In a way, too much but not enough good information. And no political diaries anymore? Not many people are keeping political diaries. I mean, there are a few. Um, and they're a wonderful source. I mean, that's because that's one of the other lovely things about history. You do all the things you're told not to do in real life. You read people's personal letters and diaries <laughs> and you call it research. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a real problem. A few people keep diaries, but I, I mean, how many people here keep a diary? Oh, well, one, two. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it's the, the great and, you know, emails on the whole are very terse. And the great art, you know, the great letters were extraordinary that they used to write to each other. I mean, pages and pages. I mean, I, I looked through some of Queen Victoria's letters for, for, my, for my book, and she just, you know, every day she must have written reams of, of pages. So, no, it's a real problem, I think. Oh, isn't that interesting? I mean, you know, I'm cautious about this because we've seen before presidents or political leaders who at the time everyone said, what a disaster. And then 20 years later, you look back and say, actually, you know, they were really pretty good. I mean, Nixon is an interesting case in point because he went out of office a disgraced man.
And I remember, you know, I remember it vividly because I was, I was a student at the time and, you know, I thought he was a dreadful person. And then I began to read about him and I think people now look at him and say, yes, he was deeply flawed, but in fact, in foreign policy, he was pretty good. You know, he, he and you can disagree with the record, but he actually took an intense interest in it. Um, and I think did get the U.S. out of Vietnam, of course, at, at terrible cost to the people of the region. But he, I think he, you know, is now being rehabilitated slightly. So Obama, I mean, at the moment I have a sense, I think like a lot of people, of a great sense of disappointment. Yeah. You know, there was such hope and there was a feeling that here was someone with such eloquence and intelligence and balance and his willingness to reach out to his political opponents. And he, he seems to me not to have lived up to it. And that may not be his fault. He's dealing with a, with a noxious political situation. Um, he's dealing, I mean, the, United, the, the American Constitution has always been set up to provide conflict between Congress and President. I mean, that was part of the purpose of the division of powers. But at the moment, my view is you have a Republican Party which has been taken over by, or is afraid of its extremist fringe, taken over by or is afraid of and which is, is not prepared to compromise on any grounds. And so Obama, I think, cannot be faulted for, for this. I mean, I think he, he and he did get, he did get his health care through um, and he is defending it. But no, I, 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 could, I could have wished the Obama presidency could have been a stronger one. But. I I've, I've, have been skeptical about them right from the beginning. I mean, he's a very distinguished historian and political scientist, but this idea that you can neatly define civilizations, you know, you, you can certainly say, you can see sort of certain values which probably spread across Europe, which derived, derived very largely from Christianity and Judaism, and, and then of course were affected by the Renaissance. So certainly you can see civilizational values, but the idea that civilizations are discrete seems to me wrong. And what he overlooked, I think, and he was criticized for this at the time, was, was the ways in which civilizations have affected each other, intermingled, intertwined. I mean, there's, there's been some, and this is where historians have been very interesting recently, there's been, there's been some very good work by historians showing the ways in which civilizations have learned from each other and have affected each other. You know, all the work on Andalus um, in Spain, where you had uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam coexisting. Um, and indeed, in many cases, intermingling um, in the arts, in, in literature, in thought, um, even at the level of religious practice. And you got the same thing in, in places like Bosnia and Serbia and Kosovo, even though the later nationalist narratives would, would have none of it. Um, or in the Middle East, where you had um, tremendous minglings of, of religions and people. So, you know, I, I just find this, this portrayal of civilizations as a sort of discrete, neat things that exist in box, then banging against each other. I, I just don't, I don't believe. It doesn't seem to reflect the way the past has worked, or indeed the way the present world works.